So, hi folks, uh, this is Paresh Motiwala from Houston. I had the pleasure of meeting Kevin over the past Friday and Saturday at uh, Data Saturday in Dallas. Uh, we had lovely dinner with some other big shots. So, welcoming him. But uh, this is going to be quick from my side. Yep, uh, join the conference team on MS Teams by scanning this code here. And definitely thanks to our sponsors, which is uh, Stream and Packet, uh, Redgate, Power BI Sentinel, Excel Agent, and Q Associates. So some serious prices coming your way, folks. And wow. What can I do to make sure that I get this actually? Yeah, um, it's a bit slow. I've kept on clicking. It's giving me the wrong options, and I'm not sure why. Just give me one second. Okay, sir. Yeah, um, when you click on people, do you mm -hmm. see that that? On people? Yeah, I see all the people, correct? Okay, and then I search see Kevin for Peter. Kevin. Yes, search I did. for Kevin. Click on the tweet that. Make him okay. be presenter because the system. Now it makes me make him the presenter. OK, so Kevin, uh, take it away, sir. I'm good. all right. Uh, yeah, give me one sec. And here you go, Kevin. Sorry MVP. About that, Kevin. No worries, uh, but feel free to. Oh, nice view in the back and you're surely not there, are you? Uh, no, although I kind of wish I were. <laughs> Cool. OK, so you are the presenter now. Go ahead and take away my share. Stop sharing. OK, it's all yours. And Welcome, everybody. Yep. All right. Welcome, everybody. Uh, I do have chat open right here, so if you have any questions throughout this, please get it in chat and I am happy to answer. We're going to get beyond the basics of Azure ML. My name is Kevin Fiesel. I run a predictive analytics team out of Durham, North Carolina. I'm a Microsoft Data Platform MVP and I have a blog called Curated SQL where every day I try to find and link to five to 10 interesting posts on topics all across the data platform space. That's curatedsql.com. What I would like to do, by the way, my slides are over here, so I'm just gonna keep looking that way, but I wanna engage with you, audience member, so I'm gonna try to look this way as much as I can. What I'm gonna do is talk to you about what happens after that first uh, initial learning about Azure Machine Learning where we get an idea of here's the designer, here's how I can drag and drop stuff, and then ask the question, yes, but what am I gonna do for real? And that's what the intent of this talk is. We're going to dive into what code-first programming for Azure ML looks like, giving you an idea of uh, notebooks, giving you an idea of pipelines, showing you the model registration process using a Quasi competitor in ML flow as the basis and showing how that applies to Azure ML. Um, I'll talk about why I say quasi competitor. And assuming that we have time, we'll talk a little bit about uh, what machine learning operations looks like at a high level. So we're not going to get there today, um, but give you a feeling for what types of decisions and processes are involved. And as I mentioned, if you have questions throughout this, please do get them in chat. I will see them and probably even give you a response. So very briefly, just so that we have level set our expectations, Azure Machine Learning. This is Microsoft's solution for machine learning in their Azure cloud. Um, and the scenario today involves a company that has some salespeople and these salespeople uh, go around and they, they try to sell our products and naturally they have business expenses like going out to eat and uh, for food. Well, some of the people were um, billing a little bit high on their meals and not providing receipts and that led to a problem for the company. And now management wants to build a machine learning model to understand what how high we expect, uh, how much fraud we expect that there was during this time period. And we're gonna try to use Azure ML to answer this problem. So this is, as I mentioned, Microsoft's primary cloud offering for machine learning. 
it has quite a few core components that we're going to breeze past because my assumption is that you've already experienced Azure ML before and have some understanding. In the event that you have never before used Azure Machine Learning, I have an entirely different presentation that is uh, getting started with Azure Machine Learning. So actually it's called Low Code ML with Azure Machine Learning. So if you need that primer, that's a link to it. I actually, this is the talk that I gave at Data Saturdays Dallas. So Paresh gets the advantage of having seen uh, the Here original, the first talk and now gets the second talk. Yes. Um, so there's a little bit of overlap and that overlap is around this basis of what are the core components? Well, data stores are remote connections. So I have data that lives somewhere else in Azure SQL database and a blob storage account or a data lake account. Wherever that data may be, we have a pointer to it via a data store. A data set is the collection of data. It could be the table or a SQL query that generates a result set that we can use. It could be a file. It could be a folder in which files have the same structure, like in a data lake. And this is going to be the data that we can use to train models. We train models on compute. A big cloud thing is separation of compute from storage. Well, we talked a little bit about storage. Now we talk about compute. How are we going to process uh, this data, train these models and score new data uh, based off of these models? Compute instances are essentially virtual machines that your data science team gets. They'll have a lot of software pre-installed. And one of the nice things about them is you can easily set up a new one. And when you're done with it, turn the thing off or just destroy it and rebuild it later. Uh, that's the intent of a compute instance. It's to give people their own local, quasi, uh, sort of a local environment so that they can perform machine learning operations uh, on their own machines without having to do all the work on their own laptops. And um, this will give you a consistent set of libraries uh, as a starting point, but then data scientists can install their own packages, they can make their own updates, they can do whatever tweaks are necessary without affecting everybody else along the way. Compute clusters are where we bring a little bit more power to the game. This is where I can have multiple machines that are working on trying to train an algorithm uh, based off of perhaps a very large data set. I can use a compute cluster to offload that those uh, operations onto machines that could be more powerful. They could be obviously more expensive as a result, but we'll get the job done faster and we can shut them off after we're done processing. So we can easily comp uh, create compute clusters that have CPU-based machines or GPU-based machines. If you use GPU-based machines, you'll want to make sure that you do have the appropriate algorithms that will uh, work well with CUDA and that will actually benefit from having GPUs. Otherwise, CPU is going to be less expensive for the same processing power. The designer, this is where people spend a lot of time in that low code ML world. This is our drag and drop interface where you can bring on components and work with them and click a few buttons and then you've got an ML model that's deployed out. We can track operations that are occurring through experiments. So these allow you to try things out in a fairly controlled manner. What I mean by that is perhaps I want to try four different algorithms. Uh, for the same data, I want to figure out which algorithm is going to be the best fit. Or I have one algorithm, but I want to try different sets of hyperparameters. I want different parameters on the training process that will perhaps lead to a better result. I can collect all of this together under one umbrella, the experiment, and have all of those separate runs be readily available for comparison. Once I've got a model trained, I can register it in the model section. And that is 
kind of the main goal of an experiment. Eventually, I want to train a model so that I can use it. We build these models, we register them, uh, and then that way they're available in the Azure Container Registry, and then we can deploy them. We can create endpoints in which people are able to call our model in real time, or in which we can drop files into a directory and have a batch processing job pick those files up and process. So that and uh, inference clusters, which is a nice way of hosting endpoints for real-time and batch scoring. Uh, historically, we hosted endpoints on Azure Kubernetes Service or Azure Container Instances. Azure Container Instances have the advantage of being really easy to work with, but have the disadvantage of not really being production quality. They are single point of failure. They may fail. They can be difficult to work with, difficult to get really good administrative data out of. But for developers, very simple. It's click a few things, set a couple settings, push a button, and you have this thing out. Azure Kubernetes service is almost the opposite, where you have a much larger administrative workload. You have to administer the Kubernetes uh, cluster. You have to understand um, what Kubernetes is, how it operates, how to manage pods, how to configure it. If you have administrators who can handle all of that stuff, Kubernetes provides high availability for your resources. It provides a, a lot of niceties in terms of making sure that your application is processing in an appropriate fashion, that it's doing the work that it needs to do. We can scale it up and down automatically within the confines of that Kubernetes cluster. And uh, however many nodes are available for deployment. And all in all, a really good production experience but a high threshold of you must be this tall to ride the ride. So um, compute inference clusters are a way of providing us compute that is in between those two, where it's going to be more robust, more resilient than an Azure container instance, but less sophisticated, less uh, base knowledge required for, as you would have for Azure Kubernetes service. I'm gonna skip this demo for time purposes because this was really intended to be just a quick review of the pieces of Azure Machine Learning that you would get over the course of a one hour talk introducing the topic. So now I wanna get us into code first programming, moving beyond the metaphor of drag and drop interfaces and thinking specifically in code. So the designer works well if you want to familiarize yourself with a topic, if you want to learn a little bit about what Azure Machine Learning can offer, but it quickly becomes overwhelming when you have 500 models that you need to train and deploy. That's a whole lot of clicking. By contrast, uh, code, it's going to be a way that we'll be able to scale out our development efforts much uh, in, in a much more reliable fashion. I can write code. I can run a loop, train these models, especially if, if they're all supposed to be, hey, I've got these algorithms that I need to uh, train against a whole bunch of different data sets. Write a for loop, be done with the problem. I don't want to click and click and click. So there are two different methods that Azure ML supports for writing and executing code that we're going to cover today. Method number one involves Jupyter Notebooks. We'll run notebooks directly against a compute instance. Method number two, executing code from a local machine using Visual Studio Code. So we'll take care of both of these approaches over the course of today's talk. The first approach is going to be notebooks. This is the simpler way to get dip a toe into code first development. If you're feeling confident with the designer, you understand uh, what the process looks like, and you say, okay, I want to start writing some code. Uh, this is a nice way of doing so. Azure ML has built-in support for Jupyter Notebooks. These Jupyter Notebooks will execute on a compute instance, on that data science virtual machine. Now, uh, if you go a little further, 
machine learning has a, a Python software development kit. And this is going to allow you to work with those different constructs that I talked about, experiments, runs, also some stuff I didn't talk about, jobs. So you'll have access to data stores and data sets. You'll be able to uh, build different components, train and register models, deploy endpoints, doing all of this stuff using the Python SDK. There's also a version two that is currently in preview. I'm not gonna show it today. It will be the future of Azure ML, but it's not the present of Azure ML. Um, that's my current opinion of it. It doesn't have all of the necessary functionality to switch from V1 of the SDK to V2. And currently V1 is still fully supported. There's a different story if you're using a non-Python language. Uh, for example, R, for quite some time was a first class language in Azure ML. I would call it no longer a first class language. And I would say that with uh, uh, quite a bit of bitterness because I like R more than Python. But there used to be an R SDK. That SDK no longer exists. It has been deprecated. And instead, Microsoft recommends that you use the Azure CLI V2 and deploy your code, your R code that way. That CLI, you could also use it to deploy Python code. You could deploy .NET code like F Sharp. Um, you could use it to deploy Java code. So you do have this ability still to work with R using Azure Machine Learning, but Python is the primary language uh, is what I'm driving at at this point. So let's take a look at notebooks and I'll bump that up one more notch. Here we are in my machine learning workspace. I've got a little bit going on. So I do have a compute instance that is running. I started this thing up shortly before we started the presentation. I do have some data stores. I've got a data lake. I've got an Azure SQL database, a couple of them here, and a few other different uh, resources that I could connect to. And in uh, notebooks, I've got a few notebooks. So in here, beyond the basics, all, all notebooks, I'll give you a link to them at the end where you can grab the demo code. But for now, let's pop up this expense reports code IPython notebook. I'm gonna bring this over. Oh, okay, well, I didn't have to bring it over. It authenticated me. All right, so what do I got going on right now? I have over here a notebook that is running in CS Compute, running on Python version three. And I could change this. Um, I'm okay as is, I don't need to change this around. My compute instance has four cores, 14 gigs of RAM. I am paying 29 cents for this presentation. So um, digging deep. But we're going to do a little bit of regression analysis using Azure ML. Uh, let's start off by making sure that things will not catastrophically fail and talk a little bit about what we're doing in this first block of code. We have the Azure ML core, Azure ML data namespaces, and uh, these are installable from PIP, but they're already on my compute instance. If you want to run this code locally, you would install Azure ML Core, Azure ML Data. The data is going to let me get data types and data paths, which we'll use a little bit later on. And these are what I need to run from Azure ML. Below this, I have open source Python libraries. One of the interesting things about Azure Machine Learning is that in the designer, there is a set of built-in algorithms. And when you go to code first Azure ML, you're really expected not to use the Microsoft algorithms. You use things like scikit-learn. You use things like TensorFlow, like Keras. You use the libraries that are readily available to people outside of Azure Machine Learning instead of AML-specific algorithms. So 
The one that I'm going to use is a decision tree regressor. And essentially, a decision tree is a series of if else statements uh, that lead to a result, a regression, a regression value. So I'm, pre I'm predicting a value based on what is essentially a series of if, if else statements. I will bring in some um, additional information. I have a few other open source libraries, NumPy, Pandas, and uh, et cetera. I'm going to grab information about my workspace from a config file. On your compute instance, you have a configuration file that is automatically generated that includes info on your subscription. And if you don't have that locally, and you try to run this library, it's going to say, I don't know where your Azure Machine Learning workspace is. So you would have to provide information on uh, the, the subscription and the workspace location. Well, if I have a config file that is set up in a particular way, um, I don't need to go look that up. Azure Machine Learning is smart enough to read the config file and fill in the details that way. This is going to be the easiest way to share these notebooks so that I don't have to give you my subscription or have you fill in values here and save them in a, in a notebook that other people could possibly read. So it tends to be uh, the best choice. Now we're going to go read from a data store and open up a data store named expense reports. This is an Azure SQL database. And on here, I have a few tables. Um, I have an expense report table and there are expense categories and employees. I'm going to get all of the data prior to the year 2017 because that was data that I know was not fraudulent. We know that uh, after internal assessments, we found out that the fraud began in the year 2017. So we're treating this as proper behavioral data, clean data. And of course, I'm going to get an error during this presentation. So let's see if I can sort out what the error is live while we're going on. Um, failed to access to the client. Ah, this is going to be fun. Um, we may have to just talk through this code and then I'll try running it locally. But the general idea here is that I'm going to retrieve data from my Azure SQL database. And let's see how sophisticated I can be in trying to sort out what's going on with my connection while still talking to you about all of this. So this was the expense reports uh, data store, expenses data store. And that's gonna be this one right here. And let's update authentication. So um, I will bring that over to the other screen while I have this notebook up. I'll see if I can sort out the authentication while I am talking to you. And then we are going to move on from there. So I do have a service principle, but it's not very happy. Um, I think I'm going to try to change this to SQL authentication and see if maybe that will solve my issue. And that might uh, fix the problem, but you know, we'll see. So as we're going on, continuing on, just in case I'm not able to get it sorted out, let's continue talking about the notebook. Uh, we have an experiment. Like I mentioned, the, the idea of an experiment is that I want to be able to provide you with the ability to compare operations, prior instances, future instances of uh, some training operation. And if I'm able to see what things look like before and after, um, then I can pick what is the, the best result of this experiment. So I can begin logging a run using experiment.start logging. And each run of an experiment is going to be independent. And the end goal will be to grab some data that is comparable across runs. In this run, we're going to build a decision tree regressor. 
and try to train expense category and expense year as our inputs. Expense categories, by the way, this, these are things like, um, this is a large city, a small city, a medium-sized city. The idea is that with different sizes of city, you probably have different costs. It's gonna cost you more for a meal in Boston or in San Francisco than it will cost you a meal in uh, rural North Carolina. Um, now, we can debate about where the food is better, but we don't have to go, we don't have to have that discussion today, uh, even though it is rural North Carolina. So we are going to predict for the amount and try to understand based off of the year and the expense category, just uh, how much we would expect to pay. We can build a data frame with those inputs and calculate the uh, root mean squared error. So we predict, given these inputs, what the amount will be. We combine the expense category expense year with the amount prediction and the amount, and we can compare the mean squared error of amount versus amount prediction. So how far off were we um, in a calculation that is easily comparable? One of the nice things about root mean squared error is that it is a directly measurable value in the unit of the initial label variable. So what I mean by that is amount is in US dollars. The predicted amount is in US dollars. The root mean squared error is also in US dollars. So if this is $20 and $23, and this is, you know, the we do the calculation, let's say that it's four, that's $4 difference. Um, that RMSE, I can now say, okay, $4, and I can find what is an average amount. I can see roughly how far off I am, and humans are able to interpret this very easily. So it's a big advantage for RMSE. There could be other calculations that end up being better for a particular case, but as far as we're concerned, um, for the purposes of this discussion, I wanted something that was more easily interpretable as opposed to something that is perhaps uh, going to lead me to slightly better accuracy. Then what I wanted to do was for each employee, log their measures. So let's measure the uh, employee name expense categories and the root mean squared error per category for each employee. That way I can easily see which of the employees had bigger changes from prior to 2017 and going 2017 and forward and see that these were the employees who were behaving in a fraudulent fashion. So I can log each one of those and save the results in a model file output slash model dot pickle. This is going to let me save my model locally and then I can register that model in my model registry as expense reports notebook model. Now because I'm still struggling to get the accounts uh, settings set up. We can go back to jobs and I should have an older version of this data. And I just need to dig it out. Um, these are expenses monitor. So let me come back to the notebook and see what I call the experiment. Expense reports notebook. Okay, so I should be able to look in here, all experiments, and search for expense reports notebook. So the last time I ran this was back in January. That's what I get for not running it this morning. Here I was thinking, oh, I see all the assets, everything set up fine, it'll be perfect. But let's, look, let's go look at this prior run. In this prior run, we have the results, and I can view all metrics. So as I mentioned, we have individuals who, individual employees, and their inexpensive, moderately expensive, and expensive cities, um, what the averages look like and what their root mean squared errors look like. And there we go. This is gonna be a little bit easier to read anyhow. So we've got a few people, and I see inexpensive cities. So these are all of their inexpensive city, um, RMSEs. And 
we can see this is for post 2017. Uh, some of these people have root mean squared errors that are significantly higher. Many of these have $5. Some of them are $15. These $15, these are the people who were pushing up to the maximum before they had to submit a receipt and were defrauding the system. So we're able to see based off of the root mean squared error outputs just how uh, much the employees were messing with our systems, uh, with our processes. And the experiment itself took about 12 seconds to run through. So to build that decision tree, to train and to score everything. What this also tells you is that we can track the results of these models over time, which means that, um, you know, this was done, what, nine months ago. That data is still available. I can still run through here. I can still grab, for example, the code that was run. This was the actual notebook that was run at that time. And uh, I could compare it to what my notebook looks like today. I can see what the outputs look like. And if I have a, a model file that came as a result of this. So if I come to models, I should be able to see the expense reports notebook model. And I have a version of it that was created back in January. And I could deploy that model as an endpoint. So if I'm confident that this model is something that I want to have available for other people to call, I can make it a real-time endpoint. So it'll give me a URL that I can access through a REST API. I can deploy it as a batch endpoint and, again, drop files into a directory and work with it that way. Or I can uh, use a web service if it's based off of a framework. So I would use one of these first two for my scenario. But once that code is in there, um, or once that model is in there, pretty easy to deploy out. And the notebooks will simply act as a nice way of providing me an interface for writing code to make deployment easier without having to click on this designer tab, without having to drag or drop anything. That said, I can also execute code locally. If I want to do that, the recommended way to do this is to use Visual Studio Code. And there is an Azure Machine Learning extension that will allow you to view what is going on in an Azure ML workspace, as well as executing code and deploying results to Azure ML. So you'll be able to click on the Azure icon in Visual Studio Code and the extensions list. And you would be able to see here are the models, here are endpoints in compute and other resources that are available without having to open up your browser, go to the portal and do that uh, in the website. We will come back to code, but first I want to talk a little bit more about model registration. And I am going to talk specifically about MLflow and then apply that to Azure Machine Learning. MLflow is an open source product. It's designed to allow you to manage machine learning development as well as uh, the entire development lifecycle. So you can train a model, you can register that model, you can deploy that model to a web server, and you can manage updates to the model over time. Now this originated in Databricks, and is open source, and you don't have to use Databricks to use MLflow. You can even use MLflow with Azure ML, but um, we'll talk. Let's let's talk about that in a moment. Before I get to that point, I do want to mention the four products that make up MLflow. First one is MLflow tracking. The idea of tracking is this is experiments. You're going to have experiments and runs. You can log parameters. You can uh, note what versions of libraries that you used because different versions of libraries may affect your results down the line. You will want to track your evaluation metrics, how well this model performed, and whatever output files get generated as a result of this. This is the purpose of MLflow tracking. MLflow projects are a way of packaging up your code that allows you to deploy this consistently. 
And there are a few different ways that MLflow will allow you to package up projects. You can do that using Conda. You can use uh, build Docker containers or uh, deploy it directly to a system. This is a little different from the models themselves. So you have sort of the package, which is going to be the way in which you deploy, and you have the model, which follows a specific uh, distribution format. Like for example, you may have a scikit-learn model, a PyTorch model, you may have a TensorFlow model. You may uh, translate this to Onyx and save your model in Onyx format. This is going to allow you to mark what kind of model that you have and help the recipient of the package, the installer of the package, know what do I need to have installed to run this thing? Because if you built, if you trained on your machine using scikit-learn, that deployment machine is going to need scikit-learn. The model registry is where we keep a, a track of how many models we actually have deployed or stored. And um, operation staff can then pick those models out of the registry and deploy them. They can serve them through REST API or batch inference. Now, as we've gone through this, I did mention that, yes, you can use MLflow with Azure Machine Learning, but it's not the default. And it's it's one of those things where you can do it if you already have a MLflow server set up and you really want to use it, you can. But the easier path is to use the default, which is Microsoft's model registry experimentation and uh, internal processes. And specifically, the, these processes look a lot like what MLflow offers. This stuff came after MLflow and is modeled very clearly on MLflow. Tracking and experiments. This is all very similar to MLflow tracking. The concepts of experiments and runs and uh, collecting measures and uh, information on what the executed items were. For each given run, I can track details of metrics. I can track output files. I can get the code that was used to execute. For projects, that code, we can execute it on Azure ML Compute. And there's no direct analog here for MLflow projects. But we do have the notion of pipelines, which I'll talk about in a moment. For model registration, we have the model registry in Azure ML. And uh, we had a chance to see what some of the information gets stored in that registry. Well, each model will have stored artifacts like our model.pickle. And this is a serialized version of the model, as well as if you have helper files. If, for example, you're using H5 to store your weights. If you have uh, text files or data files that you need to load as a result of uh, maybe having some lookup data that you need prior to model uh, inference. We can also even look at the data sets that were used to train it, which will link to the data set and the version. Because data sets change over time, we may collect different versions of data for training. and the nice benefit to this is that if my data set has shifted significantly, it will help me understand why I may have a problem with my current model, even though it seemed like training was great. And you know, just like uh, with MLflow, operations can deploy very easily using deployment to a real-time endpoint, deployment to a batch service, or to a web service which means that you can use MLflow and do all of these things, or you can use what's built into Azure ML and do all of these things. Both of them will do the job. It just depends if you're already an MLflow-based shop and you want to stick with that, you can. Uh, if you don't have MLflow already, uh, you don't need it. So now let's talk a little about pipelines. Azure ML is built around pipelines. and There are a couple of uses of this pipeline metaphor. We've overloaded it a little bit. With ML pipelines, we're performing a process, get the data, clean the data, transform the data, 
split the data, train, score, evaluate, where each of those steps feeds into the next step. This is why the designer looks like SSIS, because I can have each one of those components feed into the next. And that's our pipeline metaphor. Each one of those steps operates on the data, and the data flows through to the next step. So when we do use one of these, we are actually creating a pipeline. And that pipeline is very easily, you know, it's readily visible here. It's less visible in code, but it still exists. And you may ask, well, why, why do we have this metaphor of pipelines? Why is it so popular in computer science? And I see a few reasons why we, specifically for this case, we want to work with the notion of pipelines, why we would want to use this metaphor. The first reason is that um, it's going to allow you to script out code and source control and make it easier for people to work on different components of that pipeline at the same time. I may be working on retrieving the data and cleaning it up. You may be working on well, if I know that the shape of the data is going to look like this, because we've agreed that it's going to have these input features, how you get that to me, I don't care. I'm going to work on uh, training the models, making sure that I have uh, tunable hyperparameters, understanding what options I, ha I have available. And then another person may be working on um, how we're going to get that model written out, what the output format's going to look like, maybe if we have to write it to someplace like Azure SQL Database. Each one of us can work on this independently without breaking each other's code, without uh, causing merge conflicts, because we have these different steps, and these different steps can be stored in different Python scripts or uh, scripts of your language of choice. I'm going to stick with Python because that's where Azure ML is really pushing you, but could be R, could be F-sharp, could be some other language as well. We can also support heterogeneous compute. Like I mentioned before, there are only certain circumstances in which I would want a GPU-based uh, cluster, but when I am in those circumstances, I really want a GPU-based cluster. So if I'm performing, if maybe I'm training a convolutional neural network to read images and in that case, I certainly want to have GPUs to offload a lot of that uh, compute processing to. Well, maybe I have another mechanism for understanding uh, images or image metadata, and it's not neural network based. It's not going to be GPU supported. I may have that operation running on compute on CPU based clusters instead of GPU based clusters. So I could have one step running on one set of compute, another step running on different set of compute, and uh, work in a way that's going to save the company possibly a good amount of money, depending on just how much CPU-based work I need to do. I can also, as a developer, begin to understand that, hey, a component to train is going to look like another component to train, is going to look like a third component to train that I can begin to understand where is the abstraction, where's the layer of abstraction in here, and how am I going to be able to um, simplify my future processes and have a common function, common libraries, common understandings. Um, that's going to provide me a benefit down the road. So in order to execute pipelines. We are going to need Python installed. We do need the Azure ML SDK for Python. And I would start with the Anaconda distribution of Python. It just it tends to be the easiest. It's got most things pre-installed. And then from there, you can say pip install Azure ML core. And it's going to go and install a whole bunch of stuff. Azure ML core is the base library. That was Azure ML core in the notebook example. But remember, I also had Azure ML data, and there's also uh, a series of other Azure ML extension libraries. So we may need those as well. Now, here I am in uh, Visual Studio Code. I do have the Azure ML extension already installed. 
I have signed into it and I have my CS Azure ML uh, machine learning workspace. I can see my compute instance, CS compute. I should be able to refresh that and it is running. I've got a few compute clusters and so on. So I can look at all these resources that are available within the portal from Visual Studio Code. I have my source code here and in the pipeline folder, um, I've got a couple of Python notebooks. Now you don't have to write these as Python notebooks. I decided that I would do this because um, that way I can include this markdown. I can make it easier for you to understand what the process looks like. But you could actually just write this as a series of Python scripts. So let's see if I'm going to be able to get the right version of Python. So let's Thank go with base. Just a 10 minute warning. Thank you. All right. Thank you for that. Uh, so my base is Anaconda. I'm using Azure ML SDK version of 1.33. And like I mentioned, I do have a workspace, a config.json that has my workspace information in it. I'm not going to open it up because I see the recording light is on. But if you don't have one of those, I do have a script here where you would put in your workspace name, your subscription ID, your resource group, and it's going to write out a config file for you. Now, I don't mind you knowing. Uh, let's bring this over here. It's going to force me to log in over and over. There we go. Come back here. OK, I've logged in. Now it's going to um, spit out some more information. So I'll just I'll let it do its thing for a moment. There we go. And once that's done, we can see an experiment. So I have my experiment pointing at my workspace. and I'm going to call it uh, expense reports pipeline. Expense reports pipeline as an experiment already exists, as you would expect. Um, I'm going to create a folder dot SRC. So a local folder in the local directory slash SRC, which is right here. And make sure that it's there. Make sure that there's a temp folder as well. So let's try that out. And then we're going to create or attach an existing compute resource. Um, I have a CPU cluster already available. It's right here. But just in case you don't have one, um, I have the code here to create a compute cluster that will be called CPU cluster. It's going to run four standard D2v2 uh, nodes. I think it's about $1.37 an hour, but we're not going to be running for a full hour. So I can run this and it says, yep, I found you already have one of these, so I don't need to create it. We're going to go find our expense reports data set. And we're going to see if we run into the same problem that we did before. Um, there's a good chance that we will. But I'll try to load in an expense reports data set as a uh, tabular operation from a SQL query. So it's going to run my SQL query here. And it's going to turn it into a pandas data frame, or at least it would have if my um, database connection were not giving me issues. So uh, that's another case where I just need to fix my fix my stuff. Um, fix my service account link. Nonetheless, I would take that data set and write it out to a local file expense reports.csv. Now, fortunately for us, I already have expense reports.csv in here in temp. And this is the output of all of that. So how about I go and grab the default data store and I upload expense reports. Um, this is another thing that I've done in the past, so I don't need to do it. And I can instead say, all right, well, from expense reports, give me expense reports.csv. Oops, I do need to do that. It already exists. There we go. What am I doing here? Uh, what I'm doing here is I'm taking that Azure SQL database result set and I'm making it a CSV and I'm uploading it. Azure ML does not like working with Azure SQL database. You can work with it as I've shown you. 
but it doesn't like to work with it. It likes to work with flat files. It likes to work with flat files a lot more than with uh, databases. So it is a lot it is much easier in the pipeline space to have a CSV that you're passing around rather than trying to have a uh, data reference to Azure SQL database that you're trying to pass around. And as a result, said, all right, fine, I will simply take a flat file, I'll upload it, and we'll query off of that flat file. We're going to pull in an environment. Environments are pre-configured sets of code that are available in compute resources on Azure. This, for example, is running sklearn, specific version 0.24, on Ubuntu 18, running Python 3.7 on a, a CPU-based node. So there are different things that will run different versions of TensorFlow, of Keras, of PyTorch, uh, CPU and GPU, different versions of Python. The set of available environments you can get from here. And these are curated environments that the uh, Microsoft Azure ML team has put together. And it looks like they've actually updated sklearn. So there's 1.0 running on Ubuntu 20. So I could switch over to that, but I'm using the older version uh, because that's the one that was available when I wrote the script. Then I can create a script run config. So what this is asking for is it needs to know where to run the script. It needs to know what script to run, what compute to run it against, and what environment to use. So my script is train.py and it's in the SRC folder, the script folder. If I go into train.py, we're going to see the operations that uh, I pull out from that one notebook that I can now work on in a separate Python script. So I'm loading up a few libraries, I'm uh, configuring a run, getting my prepared expense report data set, which again is a CSV, we're going to split the data into training and test data frames. We're going to uh, build a decision tree and train against the expense category and the expense year. Try to predict the amount and calculate the root mean squared error for each person, as well as the overall root mean squared error. We'll save the result in outputs as output slash model dot pickle and write that output. So this training script uh, is something that I could have one of my development team working on while I'm working on the overall uh, notebook or script to execute. Then my training step will say, here is my CSV, and I'm going to call that prepared expense report DS, which is what I called it up here as well. We just need to know what the shape of the data is and what the, the names of uh, input data sets are going to be. We have to collaborate on that, but then we can work independently on uh, development. So I run that and I can run a pipeline. So this pipeline is really simple. It's just one step. Let's execute this training step. And I'm going to submit that for execution. So it's currently building and it has a link to Azure ML. I can uh, see how it's going. So you can see that it's currently running. It's going to do some work. We won't wait for it to finish, but it'll give you updates in real time while you're running this locally from Visual Studio. You don't have to go into Azure ML in the website and go dig up this job and see what's running, which I think is pretty nice. Um, now, if you do want to, here we have expense reports pipeline and the latest job is goofy machine, which I feel insulted that it's calling my machine goofy, uh, just arbitrary named and hashed, but landed on a funny one today, I guess. So we have our training step and it's waiting. It currently it's waiting to get that compute resource, the compute cluster built up. Basically it has to go find four servers, rouse them up from the bar and uh, go install some software on them and send my code and get it going. The end result of this is that eventually it'll take a few minutes to rouse everybody up and let's go check out Dynamic B and see how it did. Uh, we have the training step. 
we can dig in here, we can find the outputs and see the model that resulted from this. We can see the different metrics that were generated from it. And this is all happening based off of code that was running on my local machine. So not too bad. Um, we are out of time. Yes, sir. Unfortunately. So I won't be able to get into ML ops. I have a lot of information on machine learning operations that uh, will be available in the slides here and a little bit on scoring. But let's wrap up while we're here so that I can hand it off to Mr. Wilkie as soon as possible. Uh, over the course of this talk, we've had a chance to see how you take Azure Machine Learning from I'm going to drag a few things in a designer to I'm going to start writing proper code, deploying that code, storing it in source control, and then using tools like MLflow or like uh, the Azure Machine Learning Model Registry, store the model results, deploy them, and maybe make some changes over time. Um, we also have the notion of machine learning operations to add a bit more sophistication to our process. If you want to learn more, you can grab the slides, you can grab uh, links to additional resources, you can get the code. It's all at csmore.info slash on slash AML in depth. If you have follow up questions, I'm happy to take them either via email or you can find me on Twitter occasionally. Sure.